This week on The Stephen Harriet Show. I see that God has loved me in such a great way that it makes me want to love other people. Students for Life coordinator Bethany Jansen saves lives. She's here to tell us how. An army will only march as long as it's got a full belly, a full stomach. Wait a sec. Why is the education sec meeting with the defense sec? Catholic Vote Political Director Josh Mercer explains. Social conservatism was yoked to neoconservative interventionist foreign policy. And when one went down, the other went down with it. Peter Wolfgang talks about how neocon and globalist policies kill social conservatism. I'm Stephen Harriet, and this is the Stephen Harriet Show by Catholic Vote. One thing that's been in the news a lot is Syria and the U.S. airstrikes against Syria last week in response to alleged chemical attacks in the city of Douma. It's hard to follow this stuff, but I've been following it for many years. John Smirak over at the stream has already written a great article which analyzes this whole situation by using the just war criteria that are contained in the catechism. I'm going to do the same thing, but a little bit differently, and I advise you to follow along. Go ahead and Google. Wait, don't Google. Never use Google. Google is evil. Duck, duck, go. Just the phrase, just war criteria, or just war principles, and catechism together. And you'll find this stuff. First of all, the catechism makes very clear that it is our duty to avoid war. And the onus is always on the person who is proposing an aggressive act of war. He has to justify that. All citizens and all governments are obliged to work for the avoidance of war. Now, the strict conditions for legitimate defense by military force require rigorous consideration. The gravity of such a decision makes it subject to rigorous conditions at one and the same time and here are the principles. One, the damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations must be lasting, grave, and certain. Number two, all other means of putting an end to it must have been shown to be impractical or ineffective. Number three, there must be serious prospects of success. Number four, the use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. So let's go through those with regard to Syria. First, is the damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations lasting, grave, and certain? Well, first of all, who is the aggressor? Are we even certain that the Assad regime used poisonous gas against his own people? The real answer is no. We're looking for the actual evidence. But even if you don't believe me, and Secretary Mattis, that we don't know, I'll do you one even better. We never even tried to find out. In 2017, Nikki Haley all but promised not to investigate any future attack on the Syrian people when she stated, any future attack on the Syrian people will be blamed on Assad. In other words, Assad is blamed in advance, and we will not investigate. So it's not certain who used the chemical weapons against the Syrian civilians this year, but one thing is certain. True to Ambassador Nikki Haley's word, we did not investigate before blaming and punishing Assad. Within minutes of the initial reports, not within hours, not within days, within minutes, we were already blaming Assad and threatening consequences. Even though days later, Secretary Mattis admitted that we still did not have evidence that it was Assad, and what's more, we would not have evidence for an indefinite amount of time. We're trying to get those inspectors in. We will not know from this investigating team. We will not know who did it. 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 They can only say that they found evidence or did not, and as each Each day goes by, as you know, it's a non-persistent gas, so it becomes more and more difficult to confirm it. The reason this matters so much is that if our goal is to punish whoever used chemical weapons in Syria this year, then Bashar al-Assad is not the only suspect we have to deal with. As it turns out, the Army of Islam, that's right, the same people on whose word we blamed Assad, that Army of Islam, has itself been accused of using chemical weapons against its enemies, the Kurds, in 2016. Before that, after another chemical weapons scandal that brought the West within a brink of trying to topple Assad, a UN investigator testified that it was the rebels and not the Assad regime that had used sarin gas in 2013. So back to the question, is the damage inflicted by the aggressor lasting, grave, and certain? I'll be generous to the war-pushing side here and say, yes, in the event of a chemical attack that is a war crime that could potentially do lasting, grave, and certain harm to the community of nations that upholds international laws against war crimes. But ultimately, since we don't know who the aggressor is, the question is unanswerable. Pending an investigation by the same international community that, instead of investigating, punished one suspect instead of investigating both. 
which is itself unjust. Number two, have all other means of putting an end to it been shown to be impractical or ineffective? Well, if our goal is putting an end to the Syrian civil war altogether, then surely the first priority will be to get rid of the genocidal jihadism that aims to overthrow Syria and turn it into an ethnically cleansed Sharia state. Well, in case you've missed it, in the last year and a half, town after town has been liberated by U.S.-backed forces and the Assad regime. I kiss your soil, Syria, by the cries. We kneel before you, Bashar. Now they feel they owe him everything. And the Assad regime and U.S.-backed forces have molested each other relatively little. These liberated civilians, by the way, are not all big fans of Assad, but nonetheless tend to prefer to live under the Syrian state rule when the alternative is to live under the jihadist rebels, like the ones who told us in the first place that Assad had used chemical weapons this month. In fact, one town from which you can find footage of Syrian civilians celebrating having been liberated from jihadist rebels is Douma, the very city where the chemical attack that this is all about happened. Here are the civilians apparently patriotically waving the Syrian flag and cheering after Russian and Syrian regime forces liberated them from the rebels in Duma. Keep in mind, these are civilians in the town where the chemical attack was supposed to have just happened, and they are celebrating the person who committed the chemical attack against them. So no, we haven't exhausted all means of putting an end to the conflict. On the contrary, you could argue that over the past year and a half, we've only just begun to discover the best means of putting an end to the conflict, working in tandem with rather than against the Assad regime and Russia in liberating innocent civilians from the clutches of jihad. At least for now, that would be a good outcome, don't you think? Number three, there must be serious prospects of success. And again, I'll be generous to the war-pushing side here and say, yes, we have great prospects of success. In fact, I'll give it an A+. The U.S. is really good at achieving singular military goals. We're a superpower. We're really especially good at toppling regimes. As Nigel Farage said to Tucker Carlson last week, Well, just think about what's happened over the course of the last 15 years or so. Um, Iraq. We went in. Uh, we tried to get rid of the Arab nationalist dictator. We succeeded. What was the result? Hundreds of thousands of death and chaos. Libya, the same. We go in, we get rid of an Arab nationalist leader that we don't like, and we open the door for ISIS. Our track record of intervening, because morally we think we should, without a proper strategy, without working out a long-term plan, is bad. Can you imagine if the scale of the strikes was such that Assad got toppled. Do we actually think that would make Syria safer and better? You know, whatever we think, whatever we think of Assad and the support that he's had from the Russians, they have just beaten ISIS militarily in the field. So there are some big issues here where we have similar interests. That's the whole problem. The U.S. is really good at succeeding and destroying Middle Eastern countries' governments, but we leave misery and chaos and even genocide in the wake of our successes. Which brings us to our final criterion. The use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. And here's where it all falls abysmally apart. As I just mentioned, in the wake of our successes against governments in the Middle East, there have been horrible consequences for the most endangered people in those regions. Take Iraq, for example. As the Knights of Columbus reported to Secretary of State John Kerry a couple of years ago, since the invasion of Iraq and toppling of Saddam Hussein in 2003, attacks on Christians living in Iraq have increased to the point where 1.4 million Christians there in 2003 has fallen to just 275,000 in 2016. This is why Iraqi Christian Relief Council Council President Giuliana Tamarese told me in a recent interview, For me, as a Middle Eastern Christian, it's terrifying to hear that Assad should be attacked or Assad should be removed. Because we see what happened when we removed Saddam Hussein. If we remove Assad, Christians will be slaughtered across the region even more, because we don't know what will fill the vacuum when Assad is removed. It's also why a lot, not all, but a lot of Christian Syrian and Syrian expats from Damascus to Pennsylvania have been pleading with the U.S. government under Barack Obama and now continuing under Trump not to ruin Syria. As one Syrian Christian expat in Pennsylvania said last year, Syria is fighting ISIS on its own to the end. Russia is in Syria. Russia isn't stupid either. They know they have the upper hand now. They would not use chemical weapons. And also this is why last week, in response to the U.S. strikes on Syria's regime, the three most prominent Christian leaders in Syria condemned the action. This brutal aggression destroys the chances for a peaceful political solution and leads to escalation and more complications, they said. This unjust aggression encourages the terrorist organizations and gives momentum to continue in their terrorism. Talk about producing evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. <laughs>
As for me, I stand with the persecuted church in their condemnation of the strikes against Syria. This isn't the official teaching of the church, it's my interpretation of what's in the catechism, but I advise you to look up those criteria and listen to the pleas of the most vulnerable people in the Middle East and come to your own conclusion. You know, the saddest thing about all of this, and the thing that worries me the most, is that, as I reported here at Catholic Vote, just before he was elected in 2016, Donald Trump really seemed to get it. Our current strategy of nation building and regime change is a proven absolute failure. We have created the vacuums that allow terrorism to grow and thrive. Before the Obama-Clinton administration took over, Libya was stable. Syria was under control. Iraq was experiencing a reduction in violence. Fast forward to today. What we have, Libya is in ruins. Syria is in the midst of a disastrous civil war. ISIS controls large portions of territory. President Obama and Hillary Clinton should have never attempted to build a democracy in Libya, to push for immediate regime change in Syria. I also believe that we could find common ground with Russia in the fight against ISIS. My hope for the Middle East right now is that Donald Trump listens to the catechism, listens to the pleas of the persecuted church in the Middle East, listens to himself, and doesn't listen to Nikki Haley. This is The Stephen Harriet Show, the show that's more intelligent than our intelligence community. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. And now the time has come for our weekly political discussion with Catholic Vote Political Director Josh Mercer, who joins us right now. How are you, Josh? Hey, I'm doing great, Stephen. Good. Um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Make a fellow feel awkward and inferior. So anyway, I, there's some great news this week, isn't there? I've heard Betsy DeVos is about to meet with Jim Mattis about a matter of school choice. Right. I mean, why would the Secretary of Education be meeting with the Secretary of Defense. It's sort of a right. puzzling question, but what it involves is a matter of personnel, because the fact mm -hmm. is an army will only march as long as it's got a full belly, a full stomach. You need to, if you want the best armed forces in the world, you need to make sure you have proper equipment, proper training, and also you have to take care of military families. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what the nature of this meeting between Education Secretary Betsy DeVos and Defense Secretary Jim Mattis there's a proposal on Capitol Hill by a, a congressman from Fort Wayne, Jim Banks. He's a veteran himself. He serves on the Veterans Affairs Committee, Armed Services Committee. And his thought was, you know something? There's over 126,000 military-connected children all across the country, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things that they talk about when they ask military families, what's it like when you have to move out of your neighborhood where you might have extended family or neighbors or friends you've known for a long time and you have to relocate because you're you know doing service to the country a big factor for their disappointment might be education opportunities and he said well mm -hmm. you know something if we can make it a better environment for these families and give them some school choice then they might be able to find a, a catholic school or some sort of private school if the public school in that area doesn't fit their needs um, right. So what this bill does is it just expands school choice for our military families. And we're talking about 126,000 children of military families that this could impact. So the real story here this week is uh, that this bill continues to get some momentum. And Betsy DeVos, like I say, the education secretary meeting with Jim Mattis, if she can get Defense Secretary Jim Mattis on board with this plan, that could really do a lot of wonders. I mean, Jim Mattis has the ears of President Trump for sure. And uh, mm -hmm. boy, how many people in Congress are going to be against this plan if the defense secretary says, you know, we really need this to be able to retain some of the best uh, sailors and Marines uh, and Army people. You know, this is what we need to, to stay competitive and keep our soldiers and troops happy. It sounds like a really good uh, idea, a winning idea. Well, I wonder if in the long run it'll end up being a, what, what they call a pro-natalist policy. I wonder if this will encourage families to have more children, feel more comfortable having children, and I wonder if it might even build a correlation between uh, military service and good nuclear family life. 
Yeah, uh, that would be cool to see. One, the the hope here is that this would not become a partisan issue. That there really should not be any partisanship uh, involving this issue. Here's an opportunity just to provide a little bit more aid and service to military families who've expressed a need. Like, look, we we are not necessarily happy with the choices that we have available. That because we've had to uproot ourselves and, and relocate to here, can you can you get us some help here? Can you get us some school choice? And, you know, I know that the Democratic Party is very entrenched with the teachers unions and the teachers unions do not like school choice at all. So this is going to be right. a real test for the Democratic Party to see whether or not they can put their partisanship aside, put aside the special interests and put the children of these military families who are already under a lot of it's a lot of stress to be uprooted from your community and to go mm-hmm. somewhere else. It's a real test of the Democratic Party to see if they can put their partisanship aside and support a bill that could really help some families out. All right. Sounds good. We'll be watching them with the eye of a hawk. Well, thank you very much, Josh. How will we uh, keep in the loop on the uh, progress of this bill? Well, just sign up for Catholic Votes Daily free email newsletter. We call it The Loop. It's just a great way to stay in touch with all the events that are going on in the news, whether it's religious liberty, school choice, um, our Catholic faith. And I I see you've got the the Catholic Vote Loop mug there. So uh, you can even get a mug from uh, Catholic Vote as well. So, All right. Thank you, Josh. Talk to you next week. Thanks again, Stephen. Nice talking with you. Hello. Here we are in New Mexico at Mariority High School, and we are joining some other pro-life students here. Do you guys want to wave? Awesome. We're joining the thousands of students across the nation that are standing in the defense of the preborn because every 17 minutes actually we attend people's lives who are lost, preborn humans whose lives are lost to abortion and women who are hurt in the US. 46% of women who get abortion are under age 25. So that means that there may be girls even here at Moriarty High School today who are considering abortion or who have experienced abortion or who maybe even right now are at an abortion facility to get an abortion. She is a brave young woman. Bethany Jansen, she's the Rocky Mountain Regional Coordinator for Students for Life of America. First of all, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. I have to say, the reason I have you on the show is somehow we connected on Facebook, and I saw your videos that you were uploading, and I was amazed at how you would talk to complete strangers who were completely hostile to your cause. You would just talk with them, you know, in a very even-tempered way and talk to them about your message, which is unapologetically pro-life. So, first of all, why are you a pro-life advocate? What, what motivates you? You know, there's two things that really motivate me. The first thing is I see that God has loved me in such a great way that it makes me want to love other people. And that love for other human beings is the most fundamental thing that we ought to have even no matter what our faith is. And that's really the second reason, is that this is a human rights crisis. It's the greatest human rights crisis of our day. If we believe in equality for human beings, we all ought to be pro-life. What really impressed me, again, was the fearlessness with which you would talk to total strangers. Across from us, we see a couple people standing to protest us. And I'll see if we can find out what their signs say and why they're here. Hey, do you guys mind if I look at your signs? Awesome. Okay. So what's your guys' thoughts on why are you guys out here today? What, what, how, where do you get that? Is that just a personality trait or, or how do you get the gumption? You know, I think it is something that takes time and takes experience. I think after you start to get more involved in pro-life ministry, you start to realize, hey, it's not too scary. Sometimes they may yell at you, but they're not going to bite you. You know, every person is a human being. And honestly, they think they're doing what's right. They think that they're, you know, trying to help people. And so especially if you come up with a neutral type of tone, but you're like, hey, can I talk to you? Can I read your signs? You ask permission. You ask them simple questions that they don't feel offended by. We're all called to treat other people no matter what they believe with respect and love. What are some examples of success stories? Have you been a witness to, for instance, lives being saved? Yeah, absolutely. So last November, I got to hop on our big van to drive down to Phoenix, Arizona. Southern Colorado, we stopped at a gas station there. And there was a guy that came up to us and says, well, what's the truck about? And I explained, well, you know, we're trying to raise awareness that at Planned Parenthood, you know, aborted 323,000 people last year. And he said, you know what? My girlfriend's actually going through something like this. Well, we just kind of broke up, but she's pregnant and she wants to get an abortion. Wow. And so I said, hey, you know, you 
need to be there to support her. Like, why does she want this abortion? We kind of just talked through some of these things. And we said, hey, you can do this. Be there to be the dad and the father to this child. Tell her that you're going to walk alongside with her, that she doesn't need to get this. You know, maybe even write her a letter. Don't give up on her. Because the guy was just so distressed, you know, that this was going to happen to his child. So we even ended up praying with him and encouraging him. And he left. And we, I gave him my number. And he ended up texting me later saying, hey, I talked to her. And we're going to keep it. We're going to raise the child. Or are you going to do adoption? And it was just so cool that for me to see that. Like, wow, we can actually make an impact. And actually, lives can be truly saved. Wow, Bethany. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just still thinking of that. What is the most difficult thing about the work you do? I would say for me personally, it's just that there's so much to do constantly. I mean, we fight in a massive battle. There's so much to do to try to save lives. Constantly, there are children who are dying. And for every pro-life advocate, there's probably 50 people out there working for an organization that supports abortion or does abortions. So I would just say there's constantly so much to do. And it just feels like a spiritual battle sometimes to say like, okay, how can I constantly keep going when there's so much to fight for in this? Well, let's help you out. What are some ways that we can get involved or our listeners and our viewers can join you in your battle for life? Absolutely. We need every person to join us. So the first thing is for young people to go to studentsforlife.org, find your regional coordinator or just contact Students for Life. We will put you in touch because we want to empower you to actually be an advocate for life where you're at, at your school, in your community. Secondly, if you're middle-aged or young professional, we have a pro-life future group which is for young professionals. But then mm. if you're older than that, you're like, how do I really get involved with Students for Life? There's really awesome way you can support us because we cannot do what we do unless we have people out there who believe in our cause and who want to partner with us financially. And prayer is also huge because this is a spiritual battle and we definitely need prayer to set us through. Amen. Well, thank you very much for the great work you do, Bethany. We'll say a prayer for you. And again, really, really impressed with the videos that you upload. I think that is your ministry or your special gift. It's really inspiring to see the way you interact with other people. It's a gift. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Stephen. Hope to have you on again soon. Sounds great. And now I'm joined by Family Institute of Connecticut Action President Peter Wolfgang. He's a good friend of Catholic Vote. He is going to give us the confessions of a former globalist neoconservative. Is that right? <laughs> that is right. I was once a neocon, Stephen. Now the true story can be told. What's going on right now, of course, is we've been talking a lot about Syria and about the airstrikes last week against President Bashar al-Assad and the prospects of what we might do next in the region of the Middle East. You have some extremely interesting thoughts on this. That's why I brought you on. Take the lead. Well, Stephen, you know, I come at this primarily from my role as a pro-family activist in the state of Connecticut. Most of what I work on is domestic, in fact, very intensely local. My main concerns, like those of Catholic Vote, are about the life issue. They're about religious liberty. They're about marriage and family and the protection of our faith here in this country. And it's from that perspective that I have experienced a turn on my foreign policy views over the years. I what was, on earth does that have to do with foreign policy, Peter? I think it has everything to do with foreign policy. And, you know, <laughs> 15 years ago, I might have asked that question myself. When you think about where Catholics were at the turn of the century, if you're old enough to remember the Catholic zeitgeist in the late 1990s, it was very hopeful. You know, we had this rock star pope who told us we were gonna have the springtime of faith. The polls were moving in a pro-life direction. It was just gonna be a matter of time before we got the judges to overturn Roe versus Wade. And there was this growing sense that we could remoralize the United States of America, that we Catholics in particular were going to take back all the ground that had been lost in our culture since mm -hmm. the 1960s. We were going to take it all back. Right. So That's let me stop you right there. Many of us entered political activism or political commentary around the time Obama took office. Really, a lot of our listeners and a lot of the people in my generation, what we've always been dealing with is really heated, dark culture war rhetoric that is more or less always on the defense, right? We're very worried about Barack Obama imposing various immoralities on us and attacking religious liberty, and that has sort of become the norm that we have to deal with. What a difference between, between that and what you just described in the late 90s. What happened? Stephen, in three words, what happened was the Iraq War. And mm. that's what these issues have to do 
uh, with United States foreign policy. I'm a 48 year old man. I, I was 30 in the year 2000. The world that I came of age of and the world that guys who are about 10 years younger than me or younger still are dealing with, the world that you just described could not have been more different. I think the, the very reason why young Catholics today are talking about the Benedict option, which is a, a sort of strategic retreat from public engagement or the idea that the United States itself is a so-called ill-founded republic or Latin right. mass traditionalism. All of this, the reason why young Catholics today are dealing with this is they're trying to make sense of growing up in a country that is increasingly hostile to their faith, that views their faith as a threat to the state itself. That mm -hmm. could not be more different than the world we had 18 years ago. And why? The reason is that social conservatism was yoked to neoconservative interventionist foreign policy. And wow. when one went down, the other went down with it. And so as we were building up to this bombing that President Trump just did in Syria, and look, in, in fairness to President Trump, according to news accounts, he chose the least aggressive of three military options that were presented to him. There's talk now of Arab nations forming some sort of force there in that area mm -hmm. of Syria that was cleansed of ISIS. So in other words, no nation building. I hope he sticks to that. Right. But, you know, Nikki our, Haley doesn't sound like she's going to. But that's yeah. it. And that's it. You know, it always starts off simple and grows and grows and grows. And I think what we as Catholics have to think about is we really have to absorb the lessons of the first 18 years of the 21st century and ask ourselves, how beneficial has it been for the people that we advocate for, for the wow. unborn child killed in the womb, for the child who doesn't get to grow up with a married mom and dad because of these adult agendas, for our own children that are growing up in a country that is hostile to their very faith. How good was it for us in those causes that we believe in and those people we advocate for to be yoked to this internationalist agenda that wow. when it goes south, we go south with it. In fact, I think when the Iraq war went bad, social conservatives of the three-legged stool of conservatism, we were the ones that suffered the brunt of it far more than economic libertarians or ironically foreign policy interventionists. It was our causes that completely collapsed to some degree. Wow. I have never thought of that before, because you're basically saying whether Trump pursues a foreign policy that resembles George W. Bush's and to some degree Barack Obama's could directly affect the effectiveness of the pro-life movement and the anti-assisted suicide movement and any number of other social issues. All of those could suffer by association with globalist or neocon foreign policy initiatives by this White House. I think we just went through it in your lifetime, Stephen. I think young Catholics your age and younger are growing up in these dark times precisely because we just made that mistake with the Iraq War. And I really think it behooves Catholics to rethink how we approach American foreign policy in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here at home and not get involved in these international quagmires that for some reason we're the ones that end up paying the biggest price for. Yeah, well, us and Middle Eastern minorities. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. And we should, in any case, be concerned for them because they're our fellow humans. They're innocent. They're the least of these whom Christ commanded us to treat as himself on pain of damnation. And many of them are our co-religionists. That's another aspect. So if you haven't Absolutely. thought about foreign policy very much, but you're a social conservatism, you might want to start thinking about foreign policy and taking a position on it that's in keeping with your faith and also in keeping with the lessons of the past 18 years of history. So that's really insightful stuff, Peter, really. Thank you very much again for coming on, and I look forward to having you on again soon. My pleasure. Thank you, Stephen. Well, that's it for this week. This has been The Stephen Harriet Show, the show that doesn't give a flying nun what the left thinks Jesus would do. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. See you next week.